Hello, I'm here with the Aero Yoga Inform series, Suzanne Newcomb, and I'm going to introduce our next um, presenter, Carl Bayer. Carl, could you just say a few words about yourself and your position and your research? Yeah, hello. Nice to be here. Uh, I'm uh, working as a professor at the Institute of Religious Studies at the University of Vienna. Uh, and uh, I work also as a yoga teacher in Vienna. And uh, my uh, main fields of research are occultism, esotericism research, new, new uh, modern yoga forms, uh, and uh, psychedelic culture. And how did you first realize that the occult and yoga were an area of interrelated activity? <laughs> oh, well, this is a long story. Actually, uh, it goes back in the 1970s when I started to practice yoga. And uh, I was once, uh, when I just had started to practice yoga, I was uh, participating in a yoga workshop in Bavaria uh, from the Munich Yoga Center. That was uh, the largest yoga center in Munich at this time. and. During this uh, one-week seminar, we had a gathering, a kind of special ritual. And in, this was very strange for me. Of course, we were sitting cross-legged, like I was used to in the yoga uh, surrounding. But um, then they started to recite uh, strange invocations. I just remember one sentence from this invocation. The solar angel is, collects himself. Like, what? This is a mantra or what? The solar angel collects himself. And many, and many years later, I found out that this is an invocation written by Alice Bailey. And he uh, claims that it is channeled from the, a Tibetan uh, master of, of, of the White Brotherhood. Huh? So, but I didn't know this. It was it just was strange to me. And my Viennese yoga teacher, Susanne Schmieder, who founded the Schmieder Institute that is still existing in Vienna, she was also an esotericist combining uh, occult uh, ideas uh, with life reform movement uh, uh, influences and some elements of yoga that she... Uh, took from books from Shivananda and others. And so all this, and on the other side, I also knew what today is called modern postural yoga. And both things seem to be quite different. And uh, I asked myself, uh, where have I gotten in? What is this? <laughs> I have to sort it out. Yeah. And I reacted with an uh, interest in history. Hmm. So and I guess maybe, it, yeah. maybe the question is, how did you start studying this academically, is actually the question. Yeah, the question is that uh, I have had the opportunity to study it uh, on an academic level too, because uh, of my post at the university, and my, I was able to work historically then. Yeah? And actually, it, on, the, on the academic level, it started with my research in the history of modern yoga. Mm. The motivation came from my own uh, uh, practical uh, connection uh, with yoga. Yeah? And then when I started to, to investigate uh, uh, mod the history of modern yoga on an academic level. Yeah. And a lot of um, a lot of people who are watching this won't have read your your earlier work in German. So can you explain a bit about the links between the occult South Asia and occult in Europe and the history of modern yoga? Yes. Uh, so occult South Asia, uh, the 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 topic of occult South Asia is a result of my research, because when I uh, um, explored. Uh, theosophy and the, the reception of yoga within theosophy, um, I noticed when I was uh, studying uh, uh, the, the yoga-related articles in the uh, 
Theosophical Journal, The Theosophist, uh, there I noticed that a lot of Indian voices came up there, a lot of contributions from Indian Theosophists that brought in their own few. And that was slightly different from uh, Madame Plavatsky and Olcott's views. And so that discovery uh, made me reflect the usual model that uh, Western esotericism spread worldwide uh, along with uh, uh, imperialism and, and, uh, and the global uh, capitalism and though the, the col and colonialism and the colonized they just took what came from the West because this is superior wisdom uh, or was considered to be superior wisdom. So this kind of one way uh, influence from Western esoteric groups to Indians uh, dominated by the Western Westerners this uh, was, uh, I, I saw that this is not right because the Indians within the Theosophical Society had their own, their own agenda. Mm. And there were a lot of politics going on and the Indians used the Theosophical Society for their own purposes that were not uh, necessarily identical with the aims that Madame Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott had. So. And so we have now a new situation because what, what comes to the fore is that um, there is a uh, um, uh, 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 shared history, an entangled history between uh, South Asian religion and culture and occult ideas and uh, movements from the West. And uh, the, you cannot interpret this in terms of a reception history mm. because there are two uh, partners which, which are discussing uh, and, and uh, influencing each other. And the result is not just uh, uh, that one side is dominating the other side. Even under these colonial circumstances where, of course, uh, the British and the American side was, uh, uh, had some advantages yeah? politically uh, and also from, from science politics and uh, colonial politics. Yeah, uh, from this side, there were advantages and there was a power uh, difference between the Indian theosophists and the, the Euro-American theosophists. But nevertheless, they played an active role and Indian theosophy looked different from the concepts that um, Blavatsky and Olcott had. Hmm. And so more recently, you've set up a new network because there's actually yes. a lot of emerging scholars. Can you talk about that a bit more in some of the exciting yes. new directions? Uh, so I was looking around uh, for Indian scholars uh, who, are on this, who have this, the same concept and idea than I uh, had on this uh, entangled history of occultism in, in South Asia. And uh, I was especially looking for, for people who, were, who are uh, skilled in local uh, Indian languages, uh, not only Sanskrit, but also other Indian languages. Because I saw if you want to go deeper into this field, you have to uh, know the languages and you have to study uh, in, in India, in libraries and uh, 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 visiting all kinds of organizations and so on. And so I was basically looking for Indian researchers who, who, who do this. Yeah? And uh, occasionally I came across uh, my young colleague, uh, Mrikanku Mukhopadhyay, who is now uh, working at the Amsterdam Institute, uh, in Amsterdam University, uh, uh, the Hanegraaff Institute for the Study of Western Esotericism. And he was exactly doing this. He, he is investigating Bengal uh, theosophy, uh, uh, focusing on the Bengali side of, of the activities and thoughts that came up there. So we met uh, and we, we, we 
could, we had a very inspiring talks together. And that led us finally found this OSAN, the Occult South Asia Network. And this is a, a international network of scholars who explore this entangled history of Indian religious currents and occult movements. So we try to bring together a scholarship of South Asian studies and a, a scholarship con connected with uh, occultism and esotericism research. And uh, yes, you, you are right. Uh, my aim was to uh, promote uh, especially the young scholars in this field, and there are pretty much ma many of them around. Uh, and in a way, in between these two areas of research, without any con uh, so st strong support, we have to help ourselves. And so, uh, this is a kind of self-help uh, <laughs> uh, network for for scholars, especially young scholars who work in this uh, occult South Asia field. Mm. Uh, we had a, a, a conference in Vienna in, 19, uh, in 2018 and founded this network. And since then, we meet each other at conferences, uh, organizing conferences or panels within conferences uh, and edit volumes uh, about this topic and we try to foster the communication and collaboration internationally. So there's some key publications if people are interested in looking up or that you are about to come out that you'd like us to keep an eye out for? Uh, yes, we are at the moment we are editing a, a, a volume uh, on occult South Asia that should, in a way, represent the state of the art in this field. Uh, and it, I think it will be published uh, next year, beginning Fantastic. next year. Fantastic. I look forward to reading that. Um, yeah. And just because this is part of the ARIO project, and we've been looking specifically at um, entanglements with medicine, can you just explain yes. briefly how occult in South Asia is also um, been entangled with different medical ideas? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not an expert in, in many of these things that should be said uh, uh, in this, uh, concerning this, but I can tell you uh, a, a few things about mesmerism and the importance of mesmeric medicine uh, for, for occultism in India in, and in the West. Um, this is also something uh, I was thrown into through my studies of modern yoga and the history of modern yoga and um, especially the history of the reception of meditation techniques from South Asia in Europe and in this respect mesmerism and this kind of alternative medicine uh, mesmerism stands for uh, was crucial because uh, when um, through the translations of the Upanishads, uh, especially at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, a, a, a consciousness uh, was de developed about, or knowledge came up about uh, yogic meditation techniques. The, the mesmerists started to interpret uh, South Asian ideas of prana, pranic flows in the body, and uh, energy centers in the body, chakras. Yeah. They, all, they knew this uh, from, from the Yoga Upanishads that have has been, had been translated uh, so early. And the mesmerists uh, responded to that because they felt quite familiar when they read about these ideas. Because they also, in their therapies, they uh, also worked with uh, flows inside the body, concentration of, of uh, subtle fluids in certain areas of the body, uh, and, con and they connected uh, altered states of consciousness with this kind of uh, subtle physiology. 
And this and is quite was, early historically. Can you can you give a time frame for this? Uh, yes, the first um, um, 1820s, in the 1820s, uh, in German mesmerism. In, in German mesmerism, uh, there was a, a kind of uh, collaboration between the young German uh, Sanskrit studies. Indology was just beginning in some, at some universities in Germany. And there were some points, uh, some uh, sites, universities, where you could uh, also study mesmerism as a university field. Uh, there were uh, real chairs for mesmerism. <laughs> and some of, the, some of these mesmerists on, who worked on an academic level were, and who were, as German romantics often were, interested in India uh, or enthusiastic about uh, India uh, as the cradle of all wisdom uh, of, of, of this world. So as these people started to communicate with the Indologists, especially in Bonn, at the University of Bonn. There was a very famous uh, institute uh, chair for, for Sanskrit studies and, and also a, a, a trained uh, physician and philosopher who was also teaching uh, mesmerism there. And so they started to communicate and uh, he in turn, I, sh I speak about Karl Josef Windischmann, whose son was an Indologist and he was a physician and philosopher and mesmerist. And so they collaborated and Windischmann as a mesmerist has the, had the opportunity to have Indian texts translated for him by the uh, Indologists. And he wrote a, a huge volume, actually two volumes on Indian philosophy, where he was uh, interpreting systematically Indian philosophy as a kind of mesmeric enterprise. So the core of Indian philosophy is mesmerism, <laughs> or how he called it, the magic life of the soul. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lovely phrase. Yeah. And then do, do you see these themes of, of mesmeric um, therapy and also hypnosis yeah. coming into our understandings of modern yes. yoga as a treatment? Yes. So what I observed was that the medicalization of yoga and, and uh, uh, um, transforming yoga into a kind of therapy started with this mesmeric, mesmeristic uh, reception because they interpreted the Indian yogis as people who suffered yeah, uh, under the, uh, and tried to cure themselves in a kind of intuitive self-mesmerization. So they interpreted yoga practices as a kind of, of healing practices that uh, uh, are based on the same principles as uh, mesmeric therapy. And then speaking of entanglements, how did the Indians yeah. understand this interpretation? Well, when the, later when the, when the Theosophical Society came into uh, to India, uh, Olcott preached again and again that mesmerism is the key uh, to the old Indian scriptures the ancient wisdom religion of India. And uh, so mesmerism uh, in the view of the theosophists is a kind of bridge because, between modern Western science and old Indian wisdom. Basically, the Oyogis knew more about the subject than the mesmerists. Um, because their wisdom is ancient and they had a lot of more experience with altered states of consciousness than the mesmerists. But nevertheless, mesmerism is a modern sign in, in the, from the perspective of theosophy and other occult groups. Mesmerism is in a way uh, the, the latest and modern, most modern form of uh, science, cutting-edge science. And 
it rediscovers the old ancient wisdom. And this is a win-win situation. It's a win situation for the mesmerists because they can connect with ancient uh, superior wisdom. And it's a win situation for the, the Indian ph philosophy and the yogis because they connect with cutting edge Western science. But that's, although that's like very fascinating historically, do you see anything happening today? Uh, any remnants of that in, in modern yoga? Yes. Uh, of course, um, there is a latent uh, mesmeric uh, current within uh, modern yoga uh, through Vivekananda and others. Uh, not, the, not the name and the historical connection uh, is present, but a, a kind of mindset, a, a kind of uh, attitude and uh, and uh, basic ideas that look very mesmeric are still very much in common in the modern yoga scene and uh, theories. So I think there is this mesmerism uh, is not really popular as a, as, a, as a word, but as a way of thinking, it is very influential uh, in, in the contemporary yoga. All these concepts of floating, flowing uh, uh, energy currents in the body, uh, also the concept of blocked energies uh, and that you therapies uh, solving uh, energy blocks uh, and uh, the free, free flow of energy in the body is uh, identical with a state of complete health. Uh, and that these energy flows connect you with the cosmos, with the world. So being wired to the universe yeah, uh, through subtle energy currents. Yeah. This, is, is, this is what Mesmer also was uh, basically teaching, yeah, that his kind of therapy uh, solves the blocks, energy blocks in the body, and the energy can flow freely, and as this kind of energy is at the same time a cosmic energy, you are reconnected with the world, with the universe. This kind of idea, this was uh, already propagated by Methma, and it is still very much alive in the yoga scene. Fantastic. <laughs> so there's a whole other layer of entanglements we need to get our heads around if we're going to understand yeah. modern yoga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. And as uh, historical research is, is uh, uh, moving on, uh, we can uh, see clearer how the real historical connections were and who was studying what and how much uh, mesmerism and other similar concepts of health and healing uh, entered the yoga field and uh, are still influential. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate Welcome. your insights. And um, yeah, it's lovely to talk to you.